Uh, good evening, uh, and uh, welcome to those of you who ventured out on a, on a Monday evening, uh, and also welcome to all of those people who are joining us online. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, we have a great program this evening uh, in which we'll learn uh, more about one of the most famous and complicated documents in MHS's collection, uh, Thomas Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Robert P. Forbes, has just published a comprehensive annotated edition of the Notes on the State of Virginia, a work that has been called the most important book written in America before 1800. Uh, this new uh, edition uh, is the first to be based on both the 1785 uh, publication and the original manuscript. It helps to contextualize the work uh, in terms of the transatlantic debates about slavery and sheds new lights on Jefferson's uh, relatively shocking, actually just absolutely shocking descriptions of African Americans. Uh, Robert Pierce Forbes taught US history at the University of Connecticut and was the founding associate director of Yale's Gilder, Gilder Lerman Center for the study of slavery, resistance, and abolition. Uh, he's the author of the Missouri Compromise and its aftermath, Slavery and the Meaning of America. Uh, he is also a, a long-term friend of the Mass Historical Society. He will be joined in conversation by MHS president, uh, Dr. Catherine Al Gore. Uh, Dr. Al Gore has been the president of MHS since 2017. Previously, she had been the director of education at the Huntington Library in California and a former professor of history and UC presidential chair at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, for anyone who may be joining uh, the Mass Historical Society for the first time, uh, MHS uh, is the first historical society in America. Uh, we date all the way back to 1791 uh, and have been an independent organization for the last 230 years. We maintain a research library which is open to the public and provides access to an amazing collection of materials. We have close to 14 million manuscript pages available, including the papers of three U.S. presidents, Thomas Jefferson, uh, and material related to innovators, uh, mothers, fathers, protesters, uh, muckrakers, and everyone in between. Uh, we also host a wide variety of programs. Uh, we're only able to host programs like these thanks to the support of our members and donors. Uh, we hope that you'll return for future events and we'll hope that you'll support MHS. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Robert Forbes. Um, it is truly an honor to be here tonight. The MHS is one of my homes, as I'm sure it is for many of you. I spent many hours doing research in the library. I've attended many great fellows programs. I've seen the development of two great exhibitions from behind the scenes. And I've been in the audience for outstanding talks by amazing historians. I'm grateful to all the people of MHS that I've worked with and received encouragement from, and in particular uh, to Catherine, to Gavin, to Olivia Saya, and Katie Finn for making this event happen. Thank you all. Um, probably the best uh, introduction to notes is the beginning of the introduction that I already wrote. So I will begin there. Um, Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson's only published book and longest sustained text, is almost universally regarded as one of the most important American books published before 1800. It is also among the least understood. A paradox ever since its publication, Notes includes passages of lucid scientific thought, along with examples of shockingly flawed reasoning. It contains Jefferson's most passionate indictments of slavery and his most blatant expressions of racism. It incorporates stirring invocations of justice and callous endorsements of appalling judicial cruelty. It wavers between the lofty universalism of the great statesman and philosoph and the crass parochialism of the Virginia planter. A towering achievement of the American Enlightenment notes outlines one of the first proposals for a system of universal public education and proclaims a path-breaking defense of freedom of conscience in religion. At the same time, it presents the earliest plan for the removal and colonization of Black Americans and the earliest assertion that 
their emancipation would be impossible unless they were so removed. So Notes was inspired by a questionnaire circulated in the fall of 1780 by Francois Marbois, the secretary to the French legation in Philadelphia, to gather data for his government about each of the 13 states. Roger Sherman responded to the query for Connecticut in a letter of four pages, which is held here at the NHS. Jefferson, then governor, was selected to respond for Virginia. While we do not have Jefferson's reply to Marbois, which he sent in December of 1781, it was undoubtedly the longest and most detailed response, about 30 handwritten pages. Now, for any of you who have seen the, uh, and I think you may, you may have the opportunity today, have seen the, um, the manuscript of, uh, of notes, uh, you will see that it's Jefferson's writing is in, in, the, in this, when he needs to get a lot of information on a page, is practically micrography. Um, so 30 pages of handwriting equals 90 pages of printed text. Um, and after working with a, a uh, large monitor and blowing up, uh, filling the, the screen with one single word and trying to figure out uh, what's underneath the, the, um, the strikeouts, it was a shock for me to see how tiny it is in the original, just spectacular. As soon as Jefferson sent out Marbois' report, he immediately began expanding the manuscript with an eye to publication. When he first took it to a printer in Philadelphia in 1783, it was 88 pages long. The Philadelphia printer charged too much, so Jefferson decided to take it to be printed in Paris uh, when he was sent as Minister Plenipotentiary uh, to replace Franklin, or not to replace him, as he, as he pointed out. No one could do that. Um, over the next 15 months, this manuscript would grow to 116 pages plus appendices. This precious document, one of the very few printer's manuscripts that has survived from the 18th century, is of course uh, here, part of the largest collection of Jefferson manuscripts in existence outside of the Library of Congress. Um, and my wife wanted to know why is the largest uh, Jefferson collection here? And I, I responded because Jefferson's favorite grandmother married a Coolidge. And I gather there is going to be more discussion of that, of that um, bequest uh, later on and soon. Um, obviously, the MHS was absolutely invaluable to my research on this book, not least because of the superbly uh, reproduced high resolution scan of the manuscript uh, that they put online. I'm surprised, but also fortunate that more use has not been put, uh, has not been made of that resource before. The manuscript is filled with revelations. The text is supplemented by 63 attachments varying in size from a single line to an oversized page, pasted to the, to the base pages with sealing wax. So essentially, uh, like post-its. Um, most pages have extensive strikeouts and interlineations. In total, more than 6,300 words have been obscured from the original manuscript, almost all of which I have restored in the footnotes making it possible to compare Jefferson's original thoughts and intentions with the language of the published book. In some cases, the passages Jefferson deleted are jarring, such as his inclusion of Jacob Duché, the traitorous first chaplain of the Continental Congress, as an example of American genius in the field of oratory, or the comparison of the Roman statesman Cato to a notorious Covent Garden madam. In others, 
Jefferson's changes are illuminating, such as when he changed this passage, there must doubtless be an unhappy influence on the manners of our people produced by the existence of slavery among us. That tyranny in the daily existence of which we are nursed and educated from our cradles cannot fail to stamp us with odious peculiarities. Uh, you will probably recognize, if you, if you have read Query 18, you'll probably recognize that from uh, the famous Query on Slavery, except it's all there in the third person rather than in the first. These and many more revisions from an unguarded first draft to a carefully curated final version offer insights into Jefferson's personality and intentions that are not available anywhere else. This work notes, generally regarded as one of the nation's founding documents, was first published almost 240 years ago and has rarely been out of print since. Yet no one until now has studied the manuscript in detail. When I mention this to classical or medieval historians or scholars of literature, they're dumbfounded. You mean you have the manuscript and you haven't looked at it? Can you imagine if, you know? Um, William Pettin, uh, the scholar who prepared what is generally regarded as the definitive edition of notes in 1955, was denied access to the manuscript um, and had to work from an incomplete microf microfilm version. And since all of these tabs were all together, all he was able to see on each page was the, was the front uh, because most of it had to be, un had to be taken apart. Uh, and you'll see the process when you go online um, to see the, the, um, the version that uh, these folks have put online. Lyman Butterfield, then director of the Institute of Early American History and Culture, who had recruited Pedden to undertake the project, discouraged him from using the manuscript, and Julian P. Boyd, first editor of the papers of Thomas Jefferson, informed Pedden that he himself would make a complete study of the manuscript for the Jefferson papers although he never did so. Jefferson consistently described notes as a casual haphazard production, worthless, a trifle, a poor crayon. He gave the impression that it was in fact simply an expanded version of the reply to Marbois, um, an idea that most historians took at face value for many years. More recent scholars have definitively shown that Notes on the State of Virginia is a carefully constructed, meticulously composed work. In fact, Jefferson painstakingly crafted notes over the span of six years, investing more labor into it than to perhaps any others of his creations besides Monticello. Nothing in this book is accidental. A key a key to understanding notes uh, is to recall that when Jefferson says, my country, he almost always means Virginia. But the Virginia Jefferson creates in notes is more of an idea than a defined geographical place. In chapter two, rivers, he follows every waterway that touches Virginia from its source to its mouth, and every waterway, it seems, that touches those waterways, following some as far as Mexico. If all roads once led to Rome, for Jefferson, it seems all rivers flow from Virginia. Jefferson has, has embedded another more personal symbol in Query 7, which operates so effectively that the reader is apt to take it for granted. Uh, while Jefferson, in effect, presents Virginia as a proxy for the United States, he presents his mountaintop home of Monticello, located near the center of the state, as the just representative of Virginia's climate. By pairing weather data from Williamsburg with that of Monticello in a nice little uh, uh, table, Jefferson is implicitly placing his home on a par with the state's capital, 
a move that helped to pave the way for its designation as the only private residence recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. It should also be noted that this chapter has great value for the long-term study of climate change. Uh, he, even when he was away, he made uh, a friend get up at six in the morning every, every morning uh, and take the temperature and then two other times of the day. Um, this chap, uh, query seven is just one aspect of the, of the, uh, of the book that has great modern uh, relevance and significance. Douglas Wilson, the former director of the International Center for Je Jefferson Studies, wrote in a great paper on the manuscript that students of the origin and history of Jefferson's notes have not been well served by their principal source of information, its author. Having studied this work for almost twice as long as Jefferson took to write it, I can assure you that this is an understatement. I think I can answer some of the mysteries surrounding Jefferson's misdirections. The example given by Wilson is the one that jumps right out. It's on the title page itself. Jefferson completed notes in France in 1785, as I've said, yet on the title page, <clears throat> Jefferson stated that the revisions had been completed, quote, in the winter of 1782, 1783, close quote, and gave 1783, not 1785, as the date of publication. He then further backdated the book by crossing out the 1783 from the revision date and carefully scratching off the final Roman numeral I of the publication date, changing it to 1782. There has been no serious investigation of why Jefferson considered it essential to conceal the date of the book's creation and publication. Suffice it to say that this backdating continues to cause confusion. Several modern scholarly editions of notes an important exhibit at the American Philosophical Society, and even the Library of Congress's Jefferson timeline on the web get the date wrong. This is a very significant piece of evidence. As a historian, I've always been interested in those moments when the received narrative, the cover story, if you will, uh, becomes disrupted, and it becomes possible to look more deeply at what is going on underneath. I'll conclude this introduction by making a few statements about my understanding of the nature of notes on the state of Virginia. First, if we, as we have seen, it's not notes. Um, second, it is not fundamentally about Virginia, although it offers a great deal of data on the subject. Third, it is not fundamentally about Jefferson's views on the nature of the ideal republic, as many modern scholars argue although it presents a lot of information on that as well. I believe that the basic purpose of notes is to address what Jefferson sees as his fundamental problem, that the author of the Declaration of Independence, which by 1785 he is recognized, will be his claim to immortality. Uh, his revolution was not so good and he has no living male heirs. Um, the, author of the declaration is also the master of more than 200 slaves. This dilemma can be summed up in an epigraph. Jefferson 1776, all men are created equal. Jefferson 1785, I rise to revise and extend my remarks. Thanks so much. Oh, that was great. Boy, there is nothing more Jefferson than a book called Notes on the State of Virginia that's neither notes nor about the state of Virginia. <laughs> I just have to say that right now. Rob, that was great. And I really have to say, an ama this is an amazing work. Um, and it's, it's going to be an incredible resource. We're talking about uh, you know, Jefferson scholarship is a cottage industry. It's not a cottage industry. I think it's actually a full-scale full industry. Um, but I'm going to say it right now here at the Massachusetts Historical Society that people have written biographies of Jefferson and not taken this into account, and now no one can't. And you've made, a, I think, a case that this is really important. 
um, and you've spent 10 years on this work. So you now know why you had to do it, but why did you start this process? And what, what was it like to spend 10 years on this? Well, <clears throat> there are a lot of good reasons to, uh, to do an, an, an annotated edition of No Son's State of Virginia. Um, it's, it's clearly a very important book. Jefferson is clearly a fascinating person. But I never started out to do, uh, to deal with notes at all. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about uh, where this all came from. Yeah. Uh, I did a junior essay, a junior uh, seminar um, at George Washington University on, I woke up one morning and said, I'm going to write on the racial attitudes of British abolitionists. And why I decided that I never really thought about the British abolitionists before, uh, but it turned out to be a good fit with, uh, with Professor Kenny's uh, seminar. Mm -hmm. And that book took me a year and a half to write. I did turn something in at the end of the seminar, but to actually answer the question, um, it, it required an entire year just to uh, acknowledge the data that I was seeing, the, the, the information that I was taking in, um, which basically made it clear that they didn't have racial attitudes. They were not operating within a paradigm of race. They were operating within a paradigm of, of providential history um, and took as, uh, as gospel, literally, um, the idea that uh, God created all uh, people of the earth of one of one race or of, of uh, one blood. Right. Everybody comes from Adam and Eve. Everybody comes from Adam and Eve. We're yeah. all cousins. And that you know, just because we're all descended from Adam and Eve doesn't mean that we all have to get along. Remember that that uh, 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 Cain killed Abel. So I really wanted to know: uh, is this is this you know, this, this really seemed to be unquestionable with these uh, uh, evangelical abolitionists, but I wasn't finding race almost anywhere, as we understand it today, in the literature, not just about slavery, but in the whole That's amazing. The whole field. That's so odd to us Americans. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I thought, well, why is that, why is it so different in America uh, than it was in Great Britain? And when I turned to America, I applied to Yale with a project, but I didn't say whether I was going to be an American historian or a, a, a British historian. Um, I found that the same thing if you go back early enough. Right? The only people. Uh, who are arguing a for slavery uh, and b making a case for black inferiority are people who make their living either in the slave trade or in slavery, um, and their views were largely discounted because people knew where they were coming from. Um, but when I would talk to audiences about this. Um, someone, maybe several people would always say, well, what about Thomas Jefferson? Right. Because there's no clear example of you know, straight up early 19th century racist, uh, in fact, almost mid 19th century uh, racist tropes than what Jefferson uh, gives us in query 14, which remember is his uh, chapter on the laws. So he's embedded in the chapter on the laws, uh, this 
it's largely about the inferiority of black people. Um, and when you look more closely, you see that black Americans have always realized that their, uh, their great opponent is Jefferson. Uh, uh, David Walker in, in uh, his 1829 appeal uh, mentions Jefferson more than a dozen times and, and says, you know, you've got to take this seriously because uh, for a, such a, a great man as Jefferson to make these charges about us, that will carry weight. And let's, let's take a moment and sort of define too for our audience. So this is query 14. And as you say, what's uh, sometimes when I was a teacher, I would say, always look for the crazy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it is this about it's a very dry section on law. And then we start talking about the role of law in slavery. And then it devolves. And I just want to say, hmm. we're not going to probably do any extensive quoting from this because it's really for our sensibilities and sensibilities then pretty ugly. Um, but he devolves into this uh, case that he's making for the fundamental biological moral inferiority of black people and a big chunk of his argument has to do with sexual attraction that's that well, you're going wait a minute I thought this was all about laws uh, and this is what you're saying is because we have this tradition that our people are you talk about how this gets used obviously in the mid 19th century by slavery supporters and you actually make the contention, which you back up very beautifully, that Dred Scott would not, Dred Scott is, is the stepchild of this. Would you talk, and Dred Scott, if you'll just identify what Dred Scott right. is. But. So this is the, the famous 1857 uh, uh, decision, Supreme Court decision, which ruled that, uh, Dred, that, that blacks could not be citizens. Uh, and that you no know, black person had any rights that any white person uh, was bound to you know, respect. Um, in fact, what Tony said there was, this is what the founders believed. This isn't what we believe today, but this is what the founders believed. And of course, uh, he was able to quote extensively from Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Also a few politicians in the in the early 20s sure uh, from Connecticut but you have Thomas Jefferson to back you up in the 1850s so there's a feedback loop between Jefferson and Tawney um, when you look for your founders uh, when you look for your originalism uh, you've got Jefferson and you can and there is no more important founder uh, yeah so I have it's been explained to me many times that look at Tawny said uh, clearly that the founders believe this. I said if you can find me one other fine founder besides Jefferson who's writing like this, I'll give you a hundred dollars. I don't say that, but I would be very very interested. Yeah, and it it, it isn't. That's why I always say look for the crazy. It's so out. It's so, it's so outstanding. It's out, it's you also content, yeah. and I'll tell you what ten years of your life did. Um, this there's an introduction to the books 55 pages long and it is so rich and you really um there's, there's nothing for a writer like time and engagement so you make some very sophisticated arguments including what is the relationship between notes and the declaration his mm -hmm. other um greatest creation so yeah. we have the, the declaration in 1706 we have notes and you actually see them as kind of a is it a dialectic or a spectrum? It, well, Jefferson has a this serious problem um, that he needs the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's a strange thing because in 1785, very few people knew who wrote it, only a handful, and even fewer cared. It was a it was a official congressional it was uh, like boilerplate yeah and and, yeah. and it was just it was the it was the it was the um product of congress not the product of this little committee right uh chaired by jefferson does anybody in this room know who wrote the constitution who actually wrote the words down 
I'm going to pretend that I do, but I'm going to let the audience uh, answer that. Maybe you should tell us. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, was, it was a guy named Governor Morris. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think we all knew that. Yeah. And nobody has nobody cares. Has turned his desk into an icon, <laughs> uh, has turned his house into a national monument. Um, it wasn't considered important at the time. Uh, but there was a real problem for uh, Jefferson. Um, he needed this, he needed to change the understanding of, uh, of the Declaration so that it was important. Um, and what I discovered uh, in my research was that he is in kind of a, a silent, invisible conversation uh, with a radical uh, English Unitarian minister and mathematician uh, named Richard Price. Um, and Price wrote two very important pamphlets related to America, mm -hmm. the revolution. The first one uh, came out just after um, a common sense, Thomas Paine's common sense, and sort of filled in the, uh, the bones with kind of solid political philosophy, explaining why the Americans were, were right to do this. Yeah, it's very pro-American. Very pro-American. For all the right reasons. Right. And yeah. He, as he says, he paid for that. Uh, yeah. um, it almost, almost got him hurt. Right. Um, there, the most famous passage, I think, in Notes on the State of Virginia is in Query 18 on slavery. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice will not uh, sleep forever. Well, that phrase, I tremble for my country, uh, is used in this uh, Richard Price um, pamphlet of 1776. And so maybe that's coincidence. But then you see uh, that in Price's uh, pamphlet of 1784, which is essentially, it's, it's on the possibility of the revolution being a, a benefit to mankind. And by that time, he's not at all sure that it will be. He's very disappointed in America. <laughs> very disappointed. Yes. Uh, um, and he writes, let's see if I've got it here. Um, it's not in this section, it must be in the French section. So he, he writes, uh, a, a critique of America not doing anything about slavery is that if, uh, if these people do not uh, take steps against slavery, it is self-evident uh, that if they can enslave other people, other people can enslave them. Which was a very, might I say, neat little argument. It's a neat little argument. And, and I do hear the phrase self-evident. And there's the phrase self-evident. Right. Uh, and as I say, very few people knew that Jefferson wrote this document, but one of them was Benjamin Franklin, and Benjamin Franklin was Richard Price's best friend. He was also the guy who, who changed Jefferson's original wording uh, from sacred and, and undeniable to self-evident. So it's almost certain that- uh, It's a little dig. <laughs> That it's a dig. And in fact, isn't this the so second, um, the second pamphlet, so 84, which, this, yeah, we're not, not that I'm mad at you, I'm just very disappointed, America. Um, that's the, your theory about the date change, right? That you were just talking about. Exactly. <clears throat> so several passages uh, in notes, including the passage in, uh, in Query 18, um, borrow from the, the sort of rhetorical style 
of price. And that famous statement, I tremble for my country when I reflect that uh, God is just, is written, this is where the, where the manuscript is important, is written in a tiny hand, even more tiny than the rest of it, in between two lines. It's added, uh, in other words, between the time that he got to France and the time that he took the, uh, the manuscript to the publishing. So it's written after he reads this pamphlet, which Franklin lends to him, and then he gets his own copy for directly from Price. Um, so I think that the reason, that at least one of the reasons that he backdates uh, the book is it has to look like he wrote that before he read Price. And it has to look that like that specifically to Price. Right, right. Uh, he's not going to be impressed if he just threw it in there. Uh, and of so course, in a published form, it looks, you know, of course, it looks like it's just there. It's just there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. And speaking of the Constitution, you also have a really interesting um, depiction. So this is, and, and you've, I think, debunked this thoroughly. This is not a scientific treatise, though there's some science or what passes for science in, in those days. But it's almost a kind of constitution for Jefferson, because, of course, we always think of the founding fathers as all doing everything together, you know, writing a declaration, writing the constitution. But he's out of the constitution. That's right conversations and he loves nothing more than constitutions especially the ones that he was writing because he didn't do virginia's constitution he did a he did a draft but right. he never forgave patrick henry for not getting it to richmond right. on time because he had his famous headaches yeah um, so in a sense what he's done in this work is to create a United States, a vision of the United States, as seen through the lens of the Virginia planter class. And there's nothing out there to compete with it. Right? Uh, this is when the, the United States is combined, uh, is composed of 13 rather truculent republics. Um, there is no entity called the United States, or well, there's called, but there is no real entity behind that. I always think it's interesting in that in that era, they talked about the United States in the plural. In the, plural exactly. the United States are, yes. That's why it can't be my country. Right. And Virginia is definitely uh, my country. But then Virginia becomes America. But Virginia becomes America. And uh, the most uh, stunning example of this is when the um, the bust of Jefferson uh, that is uh, by by uh, the great sculptor Udon is exhibited in the uh, in, in the um, academy. It has a caption that says, "Monsieur Jefferson envoie des états de, de Virginie." the envoy of the state of, of Virginia. Virginia state. No, you need the Virginia, the United States of Virginia. <laughs> there we um, go. You must have loved that. <laughs> I think he probably, I think he, 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 he saw that catalog and said, I got it over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, no, it's, ve it's a very uh, compelling. And the other sort of rhetorical thing that he does that you talk about, uh, if we're alighting Virginia with America is his constant use of the word we. And it has a couple of effects on the reader. One, it implies a kind of unanimity. You know, we, we know, this is what we, we know. And that who is this we, you know, it seems to incorporate something, um, uh, you know, as a larger collective. It also does kind of give it the veneer of scientific treaties, but you argue that the, the way to, you have to look past the we <laughs> to regard the notes as a powerful ideological argument and political agenda. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and can you talk about what that agenda, or, or maybe we have talked about it? Well, I hate to put it as bluntly as this, but uh, the the core message in the book that comes from the center of the book 
uh, is that, as Jefferson puts it, uh, talking about um, Phyllis Wheatley, uh, he says, the verses uh, that appear in her name are below the, below the dignity of criticism. Um, and that's the essence. He's found, he's found the essence of how to deal with the problem of the awakening of African Americans and of Africans as a whole. Remember, if you go back to the early writings about about Africans by Europeans, they're they're basing their information on cadavers. Mm -hmm. They don't have any voices to listen to, and that changes radically in the 1770s. Um, and the most radical example of all is Phyllis Wheatley, who is the most, not just the first uh, black person or the first black woman uh, to publish poetry, but she's the biggest uh, literary success in poetry that America has ever had. So he has to deal with that. If he's making the case that, uh, that Africans possess never says Africans exactly. You don't want to follow them back to their homeland. Um, but Blacks uh, do not possess reason, is what he's saying, um, or imagination. Or, t or, t or high emotions, like tender feelings. Right. They, are, they are brutes. And again, it's, exactly. it's tough and, to talk about. And the key here is, if you look at the uh, encyclopedia, um, which is the model for uh, an important model for notes on the state of Virginia that, that you know, Jefferson is using, um, the the entry in that encyclopedia on um, on philosoph philosopher. Uh, says reason is to the philosopher what uh, salvation is to the christian it's their religion it's, and it's the, it's the essence of salvation yes so what he's doing by reading blacks out of the realm of reason uh, is condemning them to secular damnation it's not well, religious no, but it makes because them a different species. It essentially makes them a different species. Now, the irony here is that's exactly what what aristocracy does to the hoi polloi all throughout uh, much of the of the world. Mm -hmm. um, look at Isabel Wilkerson's uh, book on on caste. Um, but the great thing about America is that that has been transcended. This, this is a place where all men are created equal. What Jefferson is doing here is relegating this one group of, of persons, uh, about 400,000 in 1785, to the status of all of the peasantry and serfs all of the non-aristocrats uh, in Europe um, so that those who fit into the category of we uh, can share in this uh, aristocracy of, of, of skin, as it's been said a number of times. Um, and it works in two ways, the we that you're talking about, mm -hmm. because if you are not a part of the we, then, my friend, you are part of the them. And that is not a place that you want to be, especially if you are a part of the friends of Jefferson. Right. So uh, 1774, uh, Benjamin Rush, um, great uh, champion of Jeffersonianism, writes a book that fits right in with the uh, 
the, the spirit of the age uh, that says that um, the, the idea that uh, skin color is a mark of inferiority is a stupid thing that nobody could believe in. Then he has to deal with notes on the state of reunion. Right. And he writes a new medical paper that suggests that uh, he's, found, he's found the cause of blackness. It's a kind of leprosy. And blacks must be treated for this. And of course, they need to be uh, segregated. They need to be kept away because you don't want to catch this. Um, but it's a great thing because we know that they are just uh, as human as we are. Um, and we can, we can sympathize with them. We can pity them. Uh, for their condition as well as for their slavery. But he's, he's rowing against the Jeffersonian tide because we sort of alluded this idea that we're all cousins and we all come from Adam and Eve and this idea. There's going to be a, I forget what it's called, parthogenesis? Uh, polygenesis. Polygenesis, yeah. which is the idea that these persons, the phrase you use, are so different that they are descended from not Adam and Eve. Right. And I mean, that's how far it's going to go. Now, listen, we've got to turn it over to the smart people who have questions. But before yes. we do, I do have to ask you this. So 10 years. Um, mm. How did you think or feel about Jefferson going in? And how do you think or feel about him now? Well, I was not a Jefferson fan when I undertook this project. I didn't learn anything about Jefferson that shocked me. Uh -huh. What I did learn about Jefferson was I got I got a front row seat um, at the incredible capaciousness of his mind. Yes, uh, and you know the a good part of the reason why Jefferson has so many followers today is he will say things that you just go yes that's absolutely <laughs> yes. right. And what he's actually doing is he's formulating a thought that you've already had in Jeffersonian prose. Yes, it's the prose um, that it's, it's not the, the prose. It's not the reasoning, the, really. It's the prose. The reason, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I appreciate Jefferson a great deal more than I did when I started. So interesting. Yeah, that, I, I thought that was that was great. Um, well, listen, we do have uh, smart people here in the room. Uh, I would not be doing my job as the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society if I didn't also mention what you kindly mentioned. You can go online and see this, and you can see, if I have this right, senior VP Brenda Lawson in the audience, you can actually lift up electronically those little post-it notes and see what he did. So you can read what you know you would see on a microfilm, and you can actually you know digitally look underneath. Yeah. Um, I recommend you do it. It's really cool. It's cool. <laughs> it's fun to play with. So let's start with the room, because um, Olivia, I assume we have some questions online too. Um, but in the room, does anyone have any thoughts or questions? And we're going to ask you to speak in the microphone so we have you for posterity. Thanks so much for this. Can you reflect a little bit on Jefferson as an author and an editor and how you tackle some of the challenge of editing Jefferson in turn? Uh, Jefferson as an author apparently thinks that, that commas cost a fortune. <laughs> Most of I would love to know who edited the the manuscript for publication. Someone in the the printer's office of of uh, Philippe Pierre was really really fluent uh, in English and had a very strong um, authorial vision that dovetailed with Jefferson's, but pulled him out of a number of, um, of, of uh, delicate situations. And so I would say that the, that the, uh, the book is better than the manuscript uh, as, a, as a work uh -huh. of literature. Oh, yeah. yeah, this is very gratifying to hear since that, came, that question came from an editor, so <laughs> that's good. Yes, my friend. Um, did Jefferson, he lived obviously for many years after the book was yes. published. 
Um, did he ever recant or reflect upon or revise any of the statements that he made in it? No, he really did not. Um, and to a degree, at certain times, he kind of doubled down on them. And when a whole bunch of uh, his close associates, including his young secretary, Edward Cole, called him on this and said, I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to free my slaves and leave Virginia. He tried to talk him out of it. Uh, it's a constant sense that the later generations are going to handle it. It, it, will, it, will, it will disappear in the fullness of time. Um, but his prescriptions against slavery are like the former president's prescriptions against COVID. It'll disappear. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's uh, the fact of that. You know, it's, it's an interesting comparison, too, is that if I have this right, um, you know, what he saw for the future of Native Americans mm -hmm. was he thought they are just going to be absorbed into the body politic. They will, in effect, become white, mm -hmm. but there was just going to be no, nothing to do with these people but send them away. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Livy, what's the wisdom online? Um, okay, Vincent is asking, uh, do you think that Jefferson intentionally misspells Wheatley's name and how would you assess Jefferson's treatment of Ignatius Sancho, which follows his mention of Wheatley? Did you understand that? Not completely. <laughs> uh, I think the question was along the lines of- I need, I um, need, I need, I need, I need songs mask yeah, just yeah. for just for uh, i think that the uh, question was along the lines of uh do you think jefferson intentionally misspelled phyllis wheatley's name and what did you think of um Joe? ignatius sancho yeah um yes i think that's <laughs> i think he he uh did intentionally misspell her name and i think that you know was part of his instructions on how you deal with black people, um, and it, it stuck, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's sort of central to the racist project. Um, what's scary is when you read the um, the early um, pioneers of race, or you read the the uh, um, many of the Confederate uh, writers who are making the case for Black Imperiality, it's very rare to come upon a passage that is not in some way a paraphrase of what Jefferson says in, in notes. Ignatius Sancho was a fascinating person who was uh, 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 it's supposedly born on board a slave ship. Uh, he came to England and uh, gained his freedom and became a fixture in the the ton of uh, London society, um, he was incredibly well educated and friends with everyone. Uh, his, his portrait was painted by Gainsborough, um, and he had the misfortune in Jefferson's eyes of writing in the style of of uh, Lawrence Stern, uh, more specifically like Tristram Shandy, Shandy. Yeah. which was Jefferson's favorite, favorite book. book. <laughs> In fact, he wrote to uh, Stern, and Stern became one of his correspondents. So this is just incredibly This is the dynamite irritating. guy, yes. <laughs> it's ir irritating <laughs> as hell to Jefferson. Um, so uh, he, he goes overboard. He, he, he ruins it um, because he says, uh, that that the um, yeah Ignatius Sancho is approached nearer to merit in composition that is than Phyllis Wheatley yet his letters do more honor to the heart than the head 
They breathe the purest effusions of friendship and general philanthropy and show how a great deal of the latter may be compounded with strong religious zeal. He is often happy in the turn of his compliments and his style is easy and familiar, except when he affects a shandy and fabrication of words. Um, and then he says, uh, when we compare him with the writers of the race among whom he has lived, and particularly with the epistolary class in which he has taken his own stand, we are compelled to enroll him at the bottom of the ladder. And then he goes, he takes it too far. He crosses the line and blows it, he says. This criticism supposes that the letters published under his name to be genuine and to have received amendments from no other hand, points which would not be of easy investigation. So he's at the bottom of the ladder if he's black, but if it's a white amanuensis who's writing it, uh, or he's at, he's at the top of, of his class uh, if he's black, but uh, if, if it's a white person who's writing these, uh, these verses, it's at the bottom. It's, a, it's the dancing dog. It's yes. the dancing dog. Yeah, yeah. I think we might have time for one more question, a quick one, I think. Uh, thank you, Vincent, for that question, though. Anything else? Greg is curious uh, why Jefferson's papers ended up at the MHS instead of UVA. Well, can I answer that question? Yep. <laughs> and then take this home to Joanne. Um, it's, it is a story about family, so the, the, it is quite true what you said is that Jefferson's favorite granddaughter, Ellen, came here and married a Coolidge. She got stuff. The Coolidges were very, I guess, proud to have her in their clan. And so when Jefferson died, the house is being broken up. They actually, and things are just being sold, like a huge garage sale. Uh, they buy a lot of the stuff. So they make it a multi-generational project to get Jefferson's stuff. Now, the most interesting part for me is uh, it's now 1890, and we're at uh, Joseph Coolidge the third or something like that. And he decides that this incredible collection of Jeffersoniana belongs in a very important place. He is a member of the society, and we're, you know, in his heart, but he thinks it should go to the Library of Congress. Right. And at the time, we were actually building this building that we're in right now. Goes to Library of Congress. And we're a little fuzzy on this, so I may exaggerate a little bit for effect. But basically, the Library of Congress calls the papers. And they take the important ones, the ones that answer that generation's definition of history. So official correspondence, uh, anything, you know, b f letters between famous men, but all that other stuff, you know, the letters to family and to women, the drawings of Monticello and the farm book. They basically say no thanks because it's not history. It's not important. And so in a fit of peak or dudgeon, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Coolidge says, okay, I'm gonna give all that to the Massachusetts Historical Society. And so that is, and of course, this is now the stuff we care about really. I mean, the other stuff we care, of course, of course about, but the farm book is the best, almost only evidence of the Hemmings family mm -hmm. that we have. In addition to everything else, you're talking about climate change, that they don't want the temperature readings, they want in you know, the letter to some famous guy. Yeah. So it's because our ideas of history have changed, which is why we like to say that we have more Jefferson pages here in, in the Massachusetts Historical Society than the entire state of Virginia. And I can't imagine a better note to close this session on <laughs> than that. And Rob, thank you so much. And congratulations on this book. It's just thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.